So just to see how people sort of divide up here, who's a big, uh, when you compare CPAP to BiPAP, who's a big CPAP fan? It's got a few, uh, BiPAP? Anybody here not tried either? Or not, not had the occasion to, to use either? This is a, a wonderful thing. Uh, I, I don't, uh, as we go through this literature, there's, there's one, uh, to be honest with you, there's, there's one aspect of this literature that keeps coming up that I don't understand. They keep reporting lower intubation rates, like 20%, 30%, 40%. My sense is, for, like for pulmonary edema, it's almost reduced it by 100%. It's, it's rare that we intubate somebody now because these things are so, so good. But let's talk about uh, who should get it. Obviously, we know for acute respiratory frail failure with COPD and with pulmonary edema, but, but let's just sort of step through uh, case by case the sorts of things that, that it would be appropriate for. So number one actually asks the question, for people with COPD that, have, that come in with an exacerbation that's not the sort of exacerbation where they're crapping out on you, where, where this is a patient that's going to go to ICU. So this is a mild to moderate attack. Does CPAP or BiPAP have any role uh, in that sort of patient? So uh, article number one, this was a study where they tried with BiPAP to treat mild or moderate uh, acute respiratory failure associated with COPD, and they didn't really find that there was a difference in any of their measurable outcomes in terms of length of stay and, and, and how quickly it took them to get better. Uh, number two is, is it looks at the same thing, uh, of both moderate and severe. This is a review of 15 studies. And for severe COPD, these were very dramatic findings. Uh, uh, the intubation rate was decreased by 34%. This is amazing to me. The length of stay was reduced by 5.59 days. And the mortality was reduced by 12%. I mean, one way of reducing length of stay is to die. So if the mortality had increased, it would have made sense. But, but uh, that, boy, that's really a very dramatic uh, decrease in, in length of stay. As you recall, COPD was originally excluded from uh, consideration for BiPAP or CPAP because uh, obviously we would give barotrauma to everybody, and not only would you not be able to breathe, but now you'd have a pneumothorax on top of that. And that has panned out to be extraordinarily an extraordinarily rare event. Um, I, I honestly have never seen anything that compares BiPAP, CPAP to intubation in terms of the risk of pneumo. But I, I have, at our institution, in our use of it over the years, we have yet to have a case of a pneumo associated with CPAP, BiPAP. Anybody have experience with that? Where they suddenly had a tension pneumo on their hands? No? So uh, numbers four and numbers five are pooled reviews uh, on using, uh, and it includes about 14, 15 randomized trials that look at using this as a first-line intervention uh, rather than a delayed, let's, let's see if we can turn them around. Uh, instead, it's, this stuff is slapped on right away when they come in the door, and everything works in the patient's favor. Decreased intubation, decreased uh, mortality. Number six is another yes study, and number seven is a cost-effective study, uh, and this concludes that it's remarkably cost-effective because of its decreased length of stay, decreased ICU days, and, and whatever. And the next section is on cardiogenic uh, pulmonary edema, uh, and they have really the same findings, decreased mortality rate, decreased uh, intubation rate. Um, I'd be interested in hearing tricks from you as to how you do this. Neil was talking yesterday about just unplugging the nitro hose from the, uh, uh, from the, uh, of, whatchamadoodle, the thing that, the, 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 the IVAC that regulates the, uh, the pump that regulates the flow of the nitro and just get it in your own hands and hose the patient with it. Um, it takes a while for us to set up a nitro drip, uh, uh, so, I use a cheap mass nitro drip, which is a sublingual nitroglycerin. Uh, you come in, you're in acute pulmonary edema, you get CPAP right away, and you start to get a sublingual nitro uh, under your tongue. Uh, I will uh, stick my MRSA-laden finger in your mouth and, and mush the nitro around to make sure that it gets absorbed. Stick the blood pressure cuff on and start measuring it every minute or two. And if your blood pressure is still high after, and then I give you another nitro in two minutes, 
And if your blood pressure stays high, then at the next dose, I'll start, uh, you can either uh, decrease the interval for the nitro or start giving two sublingual. And if you're given two sublingual every three minutes, now you're at a nitro drip of about 60 to 70. And uh, you, can, you can keep up on that. But generally, if you do this for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and they're on CPAP, they're already uh, uh, much, much better. Um, I had an interesting case, a guy with acute pulmonary edema where we overshot by a long, um, a long shot. I think maybe he was on Viagra and denied it, but he bottomed out his pressure to 60 over palp. Came in using accessory muscles, sweating beads of sweat, ash and pale, hypoxic. I, I, I overshot and bottomed out his blood pressure. He said, doctor, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die, and we had to lay him down. And then he, his next thing he says is, what did you do to me? And I said, I'm, I'm sorry, but you, but the medicines made your blood pressure. And he said, no, 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 I don't have any trouble breathing anymore. Uh, so that's the trick, is to almost kill them, and then they feel better afterwards. But uh, that's my cheap man's nitro drip, and I generally will have the person out of trouble before they even get the nitro set up. Uh, um, I, I, f I found this a hard thing to teach in residency. The residents like to give a drug and walk away from the bedside and, and go chart. I personally find that these are the sort of patients you stand there, push them, talk to them, keep them awake, and then you can get them out of, of trouble very quickly. The people that use uh, uh, um, Captopril, any comments? Who, who here uses Captopril? For, tell me, uh, what's your experience with it in terms of how quickly it works and and why you, why you are a Captopril user as opposed to nitro? No, no, I use nitro first. It, okay. Then I use Captopril. And I used to, you know, after, you know, Matt Chin, I would Matt Chin, Yes. That was his big recommendation. Um, he used to say, if his stolic is greater than uh, 110, use 1.25 of uh, Vasotec IV. If it's less than 110.625, um, but and it, but then a few people bottomed out. Um, so the new recommendation was 25 capital sublingually if it's greater than 110 and 12.5 if it's less. And I find it's really really effective uh, after the nitro and before the license even. And how fast does it, it acts within minutes? Yeah. yeah. Anybody else have experience with it? Or any other tricks besides using uh, sublingual nitro, or you have a different way of using nitro? And how about, yeah? Um, I just pushed 200 IV. Draw it out from the, from the bottle. Push it. Push cool. It the okay. That's, that's. Run the river 200 minutes until the pressure comes down. I'll start doing the base attack. And then afterwards, we just go out and balance the other person to leave it once he's afterwards. And then I'll yeah, I like that. That's a sort of a, that's even a, you don't even have to stick your finger in the mouth in order to, uh, in order to do that. But it does, it does sort of bind you to the patient when you're, when you're rubbing your finger down. Kind of dissolve that thing up. Um, and you have to, do, you can't do it with a gloved finger. It has to do, be an ungloved finger. Um, so, so that's it for uh, uh, acute pulmonary edema. Um, other indications... There's some articles here and the, uh, that look, ask, well, what about other causes of respiratory fail, failure ex, uh, other than COPD or congestive failure? So pneumonia, ARDS, those sort of things, where somebody's really coming in, they're hypoxic, they're on the border. Can we rescue them with CPAP or BiPAP and save them an intubation? And the answer is these studies don't really give you the answer. And what, the studies are good, but there's too many patients with COPD and with uh, congestive failure uh, that are leading to the support of these recommendations. But when you tease out just the subset of patients that have um, uh, uh, causes other than that, like pneumonia, there's just simply not enough cases to say for sure, although there's a trend toward it being uh, helpful. They mention here an asthma trial. Uh, what about somebody with status that's really uh, starting to retain CO2 and crapping out on you, should you use it on them? This was one trial, of, but it was only 30 patients, and they suggested some benefit. So in asthma, again, the, the literature is not out there enough to say for sure, but for all of these things, it seems like you're either treading water or there is some benefit to it. There's nothing 
There's nothing here that suggests it's a downside to it. I assume if they did a study on acute respiratory failure secondary to tension pneumothorax, this would probably not be a very effective treatment, but uh, somebody, I'm sure, will do the study. Uh, number 15 asked the question, uh, what about patients with altered mental status? Um, I'll just ask a question to the group. If I come in with pulmonary edema, uh, what sort of patient will you just say, let's skip it and go right to intubation? Or do you try this, or you, do you try to give this a try on everyone? Depends on their PCO2 level. Uh, anybody, do you, if you agree with that? Yeah. So that's the, the comment is if they're out of it, you won't be able to use the mask properly. Well, that's what this actually, this study number 15 uh, looks at is how does this work with altered mental status? So this was their methodology. They compared uh, 20 control patients with a normal level of consciousness but acute respiratory failure compared with, uh, there were basically three levels here. Uh, group one was uh, alert and able to follow simple but not complex commands. Like they use, if you ask them to raise their hand, they could. If you ask them to cross a plant and an animal and come up with a, 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 another organism that would take over the planet, they couldn't do it. Uh, the second group was lethargic but arousable and able to follow simple commands. So now we're adding lethargy into it, and then group three were those that were even, even worse. And they ask, uh, how did this do? So the failure rate increased from 15% to 25% to 30% to 45% in the, in the worst group. What that meant was that if you took people that were pretty obtunded and, uh, with either one of these diseases and slapped CPAP or BiPAP on them, half the time you're able to pull them out and not uh, uh, intubate them. Uh, the complication rate was, uh, all they said was that the worse off you were, the higher your mortality rate was uh, over the next 90 days, not, not the day that you're uh, treating them. And they said there's a correlation between level of consciousness and pH, but not PCO2. That may be artifactual. Uh, and again, if you're, um, that's surprising because this was focused on COPD. That wouldn't be surprising a result for, uh, for failure. Um, but remember what you're doing is you're standing by the bedside putting this thing on and I'm completely out of it, but when you prod me, I will wake up a little bit. And the question is, can you pull somebody out of that? We had a, uh, 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 a lady about two weeks ago that, that was in class three. And uh, when we finally got a gas on her, as she was getting better, her PCO2 was 140. So that was, I thought that was a pretty impressive, uh, and her pH was, if you touched her, you got acid burns. Her pH was so low. But uh, she turned around and uh, uh, stayed on the CPAP for about three or four hours and actually did okay. So the main point of this paper is it is reasonable to give it a try uh, 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 in almost moribund patients, and you might be able to pull them, pull them out of the, the fray. Which one is better? Do any of you have a sense here, uh, other beyond preference, that one is clearly superior to the other? as far as CPAP versus BiPAP. Uh, this is an Australian study, uh, and this gets at the issue of power. Is a study have enough power uh, uh, to reject a difference? So this is uh, number 16, and they, they compared BiPAP to CPAP, and the conclusion of the study is that there was no difference. And here are the raw numbers, and I'm gonna give you BiPAP first, and CPAPs, uh, I mean, sorry, CPAP first and BiPAP second. CPAP, five-day length of stay, BiPAP, four-day length of stay. Complication rate, 8% with CPAP, 3% with BiPAP. They had to intubate 12% of the CPAP patients and 6% of the BiPAP patients. Death occurred in 18% of the CPAP, 14% of the BiPAP. Uh, so by every measure, by length of stay, complication rate, intubation, and death, BiPAP was always somewhat better than CPAP, but it did not achieve statistical significance in this study. Therefore, they couldn't reject the null hypothesis, and therefore their conclusion is there's no difference. I find this, I, although I personally am, am, uh, am a champion of CPAP, because uh, I, I, personally I think it works a little better in the obtunded 
the patient that's really out of it compared to BiPAP. But um, according to this study, it's not something that uh, uh, is, is particularly a good thing to do. Uh, is anybody using this uh, at pre-hospital? We're just, we're starting this in Suffolk County. Uh, and the, uh, so the rigs have it. In your emergency departments, do you set this up yourself or does respiratory come to do it? Respiratory. respiratory. Does anybody set this up your, yourself? So there's a handful of you that do it. So I, I, this is actually, I, I'm trying to understand this in our own institution, is uh, uh, CPAP and BiPAP are both far too complicated for the physicians to use, so they lock it up in a closet, and when a pulmonary edema comes in, you stat page respiratory, and hopefully you try to keep the patient alive long enough for them to come there and set up this stuff and put it on the patient. So that's the system in the hospital, but pre-hospital, the paramedics, they have this, they just reach into the cabinet, stick it on. It's an evidently quite a simple device to use uh, for a paramedic to use. It may be very complex for a physician to use, so we, we appreciate that. So uh, here are some studies where they're just doing it, and um, it seems uh, these articles sort of demonstrate, yes, they can, uh, and it does seem to help, but there's no randomized trials on this one way or the other. But this is the next wave of things uh, in the pre-hospital arena. So key points, use it, uh, use it early. Uh, uh, the data on stuff other than COPD and, and pulmonary edema, there's just not enough data. The trials that look at mild versions of COPD seem to suggest you're not really doing anything for the person. Small studies on asthma. Uh, it's uh, not, a, not appropriate for patients with signs of imminent cardiorespiratory arrest. Uh, uh, but anything short of that, give it a try. Even if they're somnolent or altered mental status. CPAP and BiPAP are both efficacious. Um, uh, nasal and face mask has been shown to be uh, uh, effective in various trials, and there's limited evidence for it in the pre-hospital setting. So any comments or arguments or anything on this? It's pretty straightforward. Well, thank you very much. It's been fun. Been, you've been a great group, and uh, thank you. <laughs>